Today we're going to be learning Pesachim Daf Pebet. Um, today's Daf is sponsored by Julia Lager Masulam in honor of her father, Robert Byron Lager's seventh year at sight. He would be amazed that I'm participating in Daf Yomi. He always taught us the importance of learning about our heritage. He is always in my thoughts. And by Phyllis and Yassi Hech, the memory of Phyllis's father and his 12th year at sight, Harav Yerachmiel Ben Yamin Ben Harav Zalman Svi Witkin, aka Jerry Witkin. We remember my father who is so missed in our lives. He was an honest, sincere man who was content with his lot while always striving to be a greater individual for Kal Yisrael. My father was also a true source of pleasure to his friends and family as his loyalty and sensitivity made all feel comfortable and relaxed. He certainly would have been proud of the accomplishments of Hadran by being part of such a talented and learned group of women. And by Carol Robinson and Arthur Gould in memory of Carol's mother, Irma Robinson, who about Moshe Zichronah Levracha. Today is her sixth year at sight. Sadly, four years after she was widowed, Irma developed Alzheimer's. My sister and I were blessed that through her illness, through her, though her illness progressed, she never forgot who we were. She would be very proud of Carol studying Daf Yomi every day. Okay. With that, those beautiful dedications, we're going to get started. Um, we have a very interesting start to today's mission. I know we've been a little bit not so simple with Korbanot, but I want you to see that in this world of Korbanot, the world of Korbanot and the whole ritual around the temple was not just about animals and sacrificing animals, but there was a lot about human interaction. The Mikdash was a place, and especially on Pesach, you can imagine everybody came, or maybe not everybody as we discussed, but many people came. And when many people get together, as we all know, there was, right, number one, herd mentality and, and all sorts of interpersonal relationship issues come up and how to deal with masses of people and how to keep things in check and how to keep things being, being done properly and how to keep people from getting into other issues with other people. And we're gonna see all sorts of interesting issues that are gonna be raised as we saw from the beginning, from the end of yesterday's staff when we started this Mishnah, a few issues that came up that were very interesting. Number one, this issue that if you're, if you're Matami, the entire Korban Pesach, we want to humiliate you. Basically, we want to prevent you from doing this. So what's the best way to do that? Well, we have a huge crowd here. So let's force you to go in front of that huge crowd and burn it in front of everybody. And that's what we make you do so that you basically, it's a preventative tactic. You're going to make sure that your Korban doesn't get sacrificed, um, doesn't become impure, because you want to make sure that you don't have to go take your big gigantic animal and burn it in front of everybody, right? That's going to be humiliating. So that's the number one, that we make you burn it in front of everyone. So as is Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Hanina said in the Mishnah, Kedei Levashan, in order to embarrass anyone whose sacrifice becomes tamit in its entirety. Now, if a small part of it becomes uh, impure, that's less of a big deal because you still have the rest of the sacrifice. There, you're going to do it in your own house. And what was interesting, we saw that when you do it in the temple, you use the wood from the temple. So there's a certain advantage that you get, which is you don't have to bring your own wood. But if you burn a small part, well, then you do it at home. And when you do it at home, you don't use the temple wood. So then we talked about the people who are stingy and don't want to spend the money. So they're cheap, right? Let's just call them cheap, right? These people who don't like to put out money for any reason. So now, if you're sacrifice becomes tame. Okay, just to answer your question, Stuart, the, we're talking here about you being, not you being tame, but your, your meat being tame. Remember, if the meat becomes tame, you don't become tame. So therefore, that's not the issue here. So now we're going to say that if that happens, and you're stingy, and you're not going to burn it with your own wood, then we're going to allow you to come to the temple and use the wood from the temple. They basically, the way the Mishnah describes it is, Hatsaikanim, let's just go back to the Mishnah and pay Aleph a bit. Hatsaikanim Strofino Talifnea Bira, Bishvil Lehenot Me'atzeam Aracha, so that they can benefit from the Atzeam Aracha. Now, why do we allow this? If you're going to be cheap, why should we let you do this? Well, the issue is, the issue is that we want to allow you, we, we, what are we worried about? We're worried that if you, we don't let you do this, what will happen? You just won't burn it because you're cheap and you're not gonna spend the money to do it. So I see Ruth, you're asking, what if you're just poor? So I think the concern here is if you're poor, you might find someone who can help you get some wood. But if you're stingy, then you're like, I'm not wasting money on this. And therefore we're worried that you actually won't go through with burning it because there's, there's like things weighing, right? There's, there's your, the fact that you're, that you're stingy and you don't wanna spend money which means that you're not going to end up actually burning your kachim. If you're poor, so it's true, you might not be able to afford it, but somehow we feel like you'll come up with a way, you'll ask your neighbor, because you're not, 
you're not necessarily cheap just because you're poor, but the people who just say, oh, I'm not gonna spend the money on this. So we say to them, listen, come do it in the temple. We'll, we'll help you out because we don't wanna end up with meat that's supposed to be burned that doesn't get burned. First of all, it's sanctified. Someone might eat it, someone might use it, right? And it's, it's not allowed to be. So therefore we want that gotten rid of. Again, we have, what we have to do is, and most of the security of the beginning of today's daf, we have to look at the whole picture. And what has to be done here? We need the system to work. So we're gonna, even though you're being cheap and that's not really something we wanna promote, on the other hand, we also don't want you not to burn your kudshim because that's gonna cause yourself and maybe others even to sin. So therefore we go in that direction. Now the Gemara talks about the second part of the mission. We're starting at the bottom of Pe'a Aleph Amabet. Nitma mi'uto. What if the minority of it was, right, a small piece? We said, you do it in your own house. So now they're going to say, this contradicts another mission that we saw not so long ago. Uriminu. Bechen, Misha Yatsami Yerushalayim. Remember, Uriminu is an introduction to a source that's going to be at the same level as our source. Usually it's two Tanaitic material sources that contradict each other. So it says, Bechen, Misha Yatsami Yerushalayim. Viniskar Sheyesh Biyado Basar Kodesh. Someone who leaves Jerusalem. Remember, it was a smaller Jerusalem than it is now, right? The gates of Jerusalem, the walls. Someone leaves the walls of Jerusalem and they all of a sudden remember that they have sanctified meat on them and they forgot and now they took it outside and that becomes, that's what we call pasul, it's um, disqualified. Im avart sofim sofrobun komo. If you already got past sofim, which we saw a few different interpretations what it was, but we're not going to go back to that. You got beyond a certain point, and this is important, is not the important part for our purposes. Then you burn it where it is. The im lav, but if not, chozer v'sofro lefnei abira. If not, you burn it, in, you go back to the temple and you burn it there. Now, this sounds strange, right? And matzah maracha, using the wood from the maracha, from where the wood they would use for the mizbeach, for the altar. So it sounds like if nitma, right? In this case, it's like nitma. You disqualified the meat by taking it out where you weren't allowed to. And yet we say you go back to the temple to burn as long as you haven't gone so far. So seems to indicate you do burn these things in the temple. So why does our Mishnah say you don't? So Amar of Hamar we're going to have three answers. Lokasha, Kamba Achsanai, Kamba Balabai. Although the third answer is really going to go back to the first. So I guess it's kind of like two. He says there's a difference whether you're a guest or whether you live here. If you live in Jerusalem, then go back home and do it at home. If you don't live in Jerusalem, then again, what's the issue? It's kind of like the people who are stingy, the Tzaykanim. Those people, if you don't live here, it's going to be harder for you to find wood and get your act together and find a place to burn it. So therefore, we let you go back to the temple. But if you live here, then it's easy to find wood. You obviously have wood in your house and or you know where to get wood because you make fires all the time. So therefore, we make you burn it at home. And that's our mission. Rapap Ama Hava Hava which makes sense. He says it's all talking about guests because the majority of the people that go to the temple are guests, right? Most of them don't live in Jerusalem. So all of it is talking about guests. What's the difference then? Kan baderech, kan baderech. Okay, so now if you look at Rashi, Rashi points out something very important, which is, that what does it mean, hechzik baderech? So hechzik baderech means you started already on your way. You were, you were walking. You weren't at, at your guest house, right? You started heading home. So if that's the case, Rashi says, third line in Rashi, lo We don't make you start to bother finding wood. Katani, and he points out, as it says, and look at the wording, Misheyatsa, that Mishnah that we quoted from elsewhere in Pesachim, it says, someone who left Yerushalayim. In other words, you're already on the way. You're leaving. You're heading out. Think about it. Once you head out somewhere to then stop and camp and, and start making your own fire and collecting wood is going to be a big headache. But if you just go, I'm starting to think of these kids who gather for Lagba Omer, they gather wood and they find these building sites, right? I don't think that was so easy to do in those days. You know, they'd have to start chopping wood and chopping trees. And so anyway, if you already are heading home, then we don't make you do that. We just say, go back to the temple, do it there and, and get back on your way. But, but if you haven't yet started leaving, then we're going to make you, even though you're a guest, you have to get your own wood. Rav Zvid Amal, Rav Zvid goes back now to the first explanation. He says, It is a distinction between the people who live here and the people who are visit, visiting. 
ואף אגב דלא החזיק בדרך, and even if you hadn't started going back, now he's going to explain why that's an important distinction if you're a guest, אך זנאי כיוון דלילי עשאו כצייקנים, כדצנן הצייקנים שורפים אותה לפני הבירה בשביל להנאו מעצי המערכה. He says, if you're a guest, we treat you like the stingy people. We assume that it's harder for you, right? So it's not exactly the same reason. It's not that you're necessarily stingy, but it's going to be harder for you. And just like we make this dispensation, and it's, what are we really worried about? Again, we're worried that you might not do it because it's not so easy for you. So therefore, any guest, anyone who's visiting, we're going to say, you can go and use the temple. We're going to open the temple, right? And let you use, which is fascinating because the, uh, if, if, Theoretically, it really doesn't need to be burned here. It's um, interesting that we're allowing the Atzea Ma'arachah, which has sanctity to them, and they're usually used to burn things on the altar. We're going to allow you to use that wood in order to make sure that these kodshim that got disqualified are going to be burned. So it's a very interesting thing here that we're kind of bending the rules because of human behavior and what we expect humans, how we expect them to act. And we think that they might not take care of it. So we're going to overcompensate for them and allow things that maybe normally we wouldn't allow in order to make room for them. Tanu Rabbanan. Ba'u l'sarfou v'chatserotehem. U'me'atzea ma'aracha en shomim lahem. Now we're going to have a crisscross, okay? What if you go to burn it in your house, but you bring atzea ha'ma'aracha? You want to use the wood from the temple, but burn it in your house. Right, this would be the perfect solution because you don't have to use your own wood, but you also don't have to humiliate yourself and burn it in front of everybody else. So, we don't allow you to do this. We'll see in a minute why. What if you want to do it in the temple and bring your own wood? Let's say you say, listen, I want to burn it in the temple. I feel like that's important, but I don't want to go use that. You know, you feel like that's hectic. I don't want to touch that. Right? I want to bring my own wood. Well, ain't show me lahem. You can't do that either. Okay, so it has to be either there, all the way with the wood, or in your house without with your own wood. Bishlama. So now we're going to say one of them makes sense, one of them doesn't make so much sense. Bishlama hama racha bechatzero bechatzero tehen ain't show me lahem. We totally understand why you can't bring. I had imagine you're bringing stuff from the temple that's sanctified into your own house. Obviously, we understand why that's a problem. Dilma Faishan Minayu, maybe there'll be some left. And what will happen if you have some left? And it's maybe theoretically you can use it to burn Kodshim. Okay, that I get. But if you have any wood left and you use it for your own purposes, that's what we call Meila. This is Hekdesh. You're misusing consecrated property because you're using it not for the right reason. But Atu Bahuli De Takala, and you're going to mess up. Again, this is. What do we assume? We assume that people forget things. People are forgetful. You might put it aside. Maybe someone else in your house will use it, not know that this wood is different than the other wood. We've talked about this many times. It's something that's not noticeable, right? It doesn't say, you know, hectesh on it. I mean, and even if it did, it could be rubbed out. You know, it would be difficult. But Ella, what's the problem with bringing your own wood? And again, we're going to get into interesting things that people will suspect other people Okay, we're going to have two cases coming up about a chashat, which is people who might suspect you of doing something improper. Okay, here we're going to have two reasons. So my time alone, Rav Yosef Amal, Shelo Levayesh et Misha Enlo. We don't want to embarrass. Here we get back to this concept of before. We took care of all the, the stingy people so that, right, everyone's kind of equal. We don't want to embarrass someone who doesn't have. This is a great principle, right? We're, we're concerned always with everyone being equal, particularly in the temple. We don't want there to be this distinction between people who have more money and people who have less money and people, right? We're going to see, oh, you bring your own wood, but I can't afford it. And then I'm going to be humiliated in front of other people again, because I have to use the wood from the temple. So therefore they say, everyone who does it in the temple uses the wood from the temple in order not to embarrass people. It's a beautiful concept. Rava Amar Mipnea Hashad. Okay, Rava gets into a different issue, and he says it's because of suspicion. Well, what's the suspicion? So if you look in Rashi, there's two Rashi's, Mishuma Hashad, because we're going to have two cases, so it's the higher one. It's about 10 lines above where we are right now. What happens? If I bring my own wood, let's say I don't need it all to burn it, and I don't know how much wood it's going to take. So I bring a pile of wood. I finish, I bring it back home. Now what's going to happen when people see me walking out of the temple, carrying wood? They're going to think, they're going to think two things. Number one, that I'm stealing hectares. Number two, that I'm using them for my own purposes. 
that creates very bad environment in Jerusalem when people start suspecting other people of doing things. So they definitely don't want people walking out with wood from the temple. That will create a bad environment. My Benayu, classic Gemara question. So we have two answers. One is, so as not to embarrass other people so everyone's equal. The other is, in case people suspect you. So they say, what's the difference? Where will there be a difference between the two answers? If you bring reeds and, and branches that aren't wood, that it's not things that we wouldn't necessarily be, that can't be used in the temple for the fire there, then if we use those things, then it's not a concern because if somebody sees me carrying them back from the temple, they won't think I stole from the Yatzei Maracha because those aren't, can't be used for the Yatzei Maracha. Um, again, the Yatzei Maracha is the wood they use to go on the altar. De de la maracha. Okay, those are not, can't be used on the maracha and therefore there'll be no issue of suspicion. However, it will still be a problem if we want to create equality and everyone is equal and everyone, nobody's embarrassed that they can't afford to bring their own wood then it doesn't make a difference what type of what, what type of items you bring to burn. It's all going to be the same. Last issue on this topic, Tznan Hatam. They're now quoting a Mishnah from Masechet Tamid, which we'll get to in the Daf Yomi much, much later in the cycle. Very interesting Masechet, which talks about what went on in the daily goings on of the temple. Although we'll see some of that in Shkalim also, which is our next Masechet after Pesachim. Rosh HaMa'amad Hayam Ma'amid Tatmeim Al Shar HaMizrach. So now we have this situation where the Kohanim would come in Mishmarot. Every twice a year, the Kohanim would come. There were 24 Mishmarot and on all the holidays, okay? And in Israel, we have Miluim, right? You have to go to, you know, your, your designated X amount of times a year to go back to the army, right? If you served in the army, you have to go every periodically. So also the Kohanim had to go periodically to the temple. It was probably worse than Miluim because they always had to go on the Chagim also, right? They're poor wives. Um, but anyway, what would happen? It's your week to come. And let's say you're tame, you're impure. Well, it's pretty bad, right? You have only two weeks a year plus the holidays that you come. And now you get there to work that, that week and you're tame. So Rosh HaMa'amad, the guy in charge there with Ma'amidat HaTme'im al Sharam Mizrach, he would make them all, anyone who was impure, they would have to stand at the, the entrance, the side, the entrance into the temple was on the Eastern side, stand by the Eastern gate and kind of put them up there your tzmeim. It would be like a, like a procession, you know, of all the kohanim that are supposed to work this week, but instead they're impure. So this sounds a little bit strange, and we're going to try to figure out why do they do this. My taima. Amachav Yosef, Kedela Vaishan, just like we started our, our Mishnah, right? It's to embarrass them, just like the person who messed up their Korban Pesach. What, what an idiot, you know, how'd you do that? Make sure you do everything in your, in your capability possible to make sure that doesn't happen. Likewise, if you're a Kohen and you have two weeks a year where you're supposed to work, you better make sure that you're not going to become Tamei. So they put them up to embarrass them so that they don't do it again. Preventative. Rava Amar Mipne Hashad. He says, no, that's not the issue. The issue is we don't want people to suspect them. So what will people suspect them of? So Rashi says, Shalo, now we're on the second Mishum Hashad. Shalo Yachshidum. Okay, it's about parallel to where we are right now in Rashi. Shemipne Melachtam Him Nichdalim Lavo Lavod Avoda. What would be a reason you wouldn't want to come do your week in the temple, right? You would think, oh, Cohen, very exciting to do your work in the temple. But just like me, Louis, you have to leave your job. Now, the government compensates you. But in those days, the government didn't compensate you for the fact that you weren't working that week. You don't want to lose your job for that week, right? You have a job. You need to make money. You need to bring food home. So if people see that you're not in the temple, they might say, now you have to wonder how everyone's going to know you're not in the temple. But let's assume somehow they know. They're going to say, oh, he must be, you know, working so that he doesn't, you know, struggle with the money and therefore he didn't show up. And people are going to say, now this thing's about, you know, his job was more important to him, the money was more important than serving in the temple. So because of that, that's the issue. So my, that's why they stand them all up and everybody sees them and then everybody knows the reason they're not working is because they're to be, it's not to embarrass them, it's specifically to kind of protect them from suspicion of other people. Again, this just shows you uh, the environment and that, you know, there was so much competition and, and issues going on and people were suspect of other people. And you see that, right, this is human nature, happens all the time, right? People try to look negatively upon other people. And here, what's interesting is instead of saying, well, you shouldn't do that, which is true, you shouldn't do that. That this doesn't preclude us from saying, one should never suspect other people, right? Have and all that. But it's the issue that 
society has to also do what they can to ensure that, you know, you should always do things in a way that doesn't cause people to suspect you of things. So there's always this fine balance between the two. So now they say the classic my benayu, what's the difference, the halacha between them? Both these cases are cases where nobody will suspect that you're keeping your, that you're working instead of going to the temple. And this is because number one, either you're mefanke, you, you're a la a lazy or you're spoiled and you don't really work. So if you don't really work and then you don't show up in the temple, nobody's going to think, now it's actually interesting. You would think someone who doesn't work, people might suspect you're being lazy and you're not going to the temple. But the point is you don't have a job pulling you on the other side. So because of that, we're not, no one's going to think, oh, you didn't want to lose your, you know, you didn't want to lose out your income for this week because you don't really work in any case. Or you work at a job, this is very interesting, you work at a job where you, you deal with ropes, okay, you tie knots and stuff, which is not really, right, all I can think of is Sophim, that's all they do, they tie knots, um, but it's not a very lucrative job. And because it's not a lucrative job, so you lose a week of work, it's not such a big deal. Now, again, one could say the opposite. You must really be poor if you do that. And then you specifically need your job, but they claim nobody's going to think, oh, you had to go work and tie your knots this week instead of going to the temple because it's just not worth what you're making. Okay. So this was a very interesting section, again, just to kind of put it in perspective. And, and you know, again, in the middle of this section of Carbono, which is a little bit heavy and, and all these topics that we don't really understand, this is a topic we very well understand about human nature, about people, about relationships, about equalizing people, having poor people not be embarrassed in front of richer people, all this kind of interesting issues that the temple was really a home for all of these. It was almost like a, what do you, what do you call it? A, um, like an experiment, you know, where you have all these people together and from there we can learn so many lessons for life in general, right? So it, it's giving you this example of, right? A microcosm of, of really everything and how to behave with other people and how, you know, it teaches you don't be suspicious, right? Or also don't do anything that will arise, cause people to be suspicious of you. And all sorts of interesting ideas come out of this. Okay, moving on now to our next mission. Now, what do we do with this meat that became Tameh? So if it left the walls of Jerusalem, which it's not allowed to, or it became impure, we burn it immediately. But again, we keep distinguishing between the meat, which is a psul in the goof of the korban, the meat, it's, right? The, the korban itself became disqualified, or if the owners died, or they became impure, which is not a problem in the sacrifice itself. Then to ubar tzuratovi yisaref b'shishasa. Now, what happens in this case? So you have to leave it overnight. What's overnight? Well, we're talking, we're standing on the 14th in the afternoon doing the Korban Pesach. So now you leave it overnight. That gives you, remember to ubar tzuratov. This is a case where we don't want you to burn it immediately. You have to wait. We talked about this. We compared it to um, Shemitah produce where you can't, because it has sanctity to it, you can't throw it out immediately. So you wait till it rots a little bit or a lot, depending on what opinion you hold by. To Bart Sureto also, we said Rashi says you leave it overnight, right? And that's enough. Other people say you have to wait till it gets really a little more disgusting. But either which way they say here, let's say we go with Rashi overnight. So theoretically you would burn it on the 15th in the morning. What's the problem? You can't burn it on the 15th because it's a holiday. We don't allow you to burn for this reason. So we push it off to the 16th, which is no longer Yom Tov. Okay, and therefore you burn it on the 16th. But there's a machloket about this. So again, let's just review. If the meat became impure or got disqualified because you took it out of its place, then you burn it immediately. If the owners became impure or died and we no longer have owners and we have this meat and now we're stuck with it, what do we do with it? So you leave it overnight and then you burn it the next day, which you can't, so you wait one more day till the 16th. Rabbi Yochanan ben Baruch Omer, he disagrees and says, Af ze yisaref miyad lefi she'en lo ochlin. Since there's no one to eat this carbon Pesach, you also have to burn it and you burn it immediately. Okay, everyone agrees you burn it, it's just a matter of you burn it immediately or do you wait? So now we're going to have a whole discussion about this. There's a bunch of psukim that are very important. I brought them all on the sheet. So if you have the sheet, you should look at it. Bishlama tamei k'tiv. So tamei, how do we know? We're now going to go through, we're starting with the first part meat that becomes impure or gets taken out of the walls of where it's supposed to be, which we'll talk about this soon. If it's koche kochim, which is the higher sanctity of korbanot, the ones that don't get eaten by its owners, not the Pesach, 
it can it can only be in the azara. If it's taken out of the azara, it's disqualified. If it's kochim kalim naked, even by the owners, then the owners can eat them in Jerusalem, and it's the issue of taking them out of the walls of Jerusalem. So we understand tameh because there's an explicit verse in the Torah that tells you you have to burn it. How do we know that? Ketiv. It says in the pasuk, and this is vayikra zayin pasuk yutet, v'habasar asher yiga bechol tameh lo yeyachel ba'esh yisare. Meat that get touched comes in contact with something impure cannot be eaten. It has to be burned. Okay, very simple. Ela yotze minalam. But where do we get yotze from? This is going to be much more complicated. Dichtiv. Hein lo huva etama ela kodesh pnima. Okay, they're quoting a verse in the middle of a section. I'm going to read you the whole section and explain to you what's going on. It's a section that is a favorite, I would say, in the land of Korbanot. It comes up a lot because it relates to a few topics and it's very confusing. And if you don't get it today, don't worry, we'll see it a lot of times. Eventually you'll understand the section. Um, so it's this very strange section in the middle of, and this actually goes back to, again, the human interactions around the Korbanot because we have this fascinating event that happens during the Yemei HaMiluim. These were the days when they sanctified the Mishkan after they built it. They had an eight day ceremony and in the middle of which Nadav and Abihu die because they bring their own fire and they're not allowed to do that and they die in the middle. It's crazy, right? What goes on there? If you think about this, this huge event and Nadav and Abihu die, and then this other strange thing happens after they die. Ve'et si'ir ha'chatat, they were supposed to bring the si'ir ha'chatat, which they brought, they sacrificed, okay? This is a kochi kochim because it's a chatat. And what's supposed to happen with the chatat? The, the, um, the koanim get to eat the meat. So what happened to the si'ir ha'chatat? Darosh darash Moshe, Moshe went looking for it, vihine sorat, and he found out that they burnt it and they didn't eat it. Vayiktsof, okay, in the middle of the Shmona Imei Amiluim, Moshe gets angry. Ale Lazar valitamar b'nei arona notarim, right, he even specifies, right, Nadav and Avi were dead. Here we're left with the two sons of Aaron, and somehow they burnt this, right, you already have that Nadav and Avi brought their own fire, and now Elazar Tamar or Aaron, we're not sure who, burns their, their meat instead of eating it. And he says to them, Why didn't you eat this chatat? You were supposed to eat it. It's kodesh kodeshim. You're supposed to eat that. This is for you to atone for the people. You're supposed to eat the meat. So why did you burn it? And now he starts questioning them. Okay, I'll explain this the way the Gemara is going to explain it. Okay, so it'll be clear. He says, It wasn't... It's not like you brought the blood now. Let me give you some background. This doesn't have to do with our issue, but it's part of the Pshad of the Sukim, so I'm going to explain it, which is, if you have, there's different chata'ot, okay, sin offerings. Some we've talked about. The blood gets sprinkled on the inner altar in the Heichal, in the sanctuary, and some gets on the regular Mizbeach, which was the big Mizbeach that was in the Azara, but not in the Heichal, not in the sanctuary. So a lot of the blood, a lot of the chata'ot get sprinkled. So there's chata'ot chitzoniot that get outside and chata'ot pnimiot that go inside. So the blood sometimes goes on the mizbeach haktoret, which is inside, and sometimes on the big mizbeach outside. If you have a chata'ot that's supposed to be, the blood is supposed to go on the outside mizbeach, like this one, and you bring the blood inside to the heichal, you've disqualified your korban and you have to burn it. So he says, it's not like that happened. If so, I would understand why you burnt it. But lo vadama pnima, you didn't bring the blood inside, although we'll see in the Gemara, they're going to explain it as, as it was a question. That Moshe was asking him, did you maybe bring the blood inside? And is that why you burnt it? Okay. Now, so Moshe attacks them and says, what on earth are you doing? To which Aharon, and this is even more interesting, Aharon responds and says, Aharon Moshe. What's amazing about this is to think that this was going on in the Imam Yiluim between Moshe and Aharon, right? Our two great leaders. And the end of in this big Argument in the middle of the Shmona Imam Elohim. And Aaron says, Moshe, hayom Hashem, oti ka'ele. They're bringing their sacrifices and you're accusing me? Is that was like, how dare you? And he says, hayom hayitav Hashem. He says, You think if I eat the chatat today, God's going to be pleased with me? In other words, I wasn't supposed to eat this. No way, no how. There's two explanations given in the Gemara and Zvachim about why. Okay, what, what, why was Aharon right? And we're going to see he was right because the next verse is Vayishma Moshe Vayitav Be'enav. Moshe accepted what Aharon said. So here it's a fascinating story, even especially at the end of it. Moshe got angry really for no reason. He was totally out of line. He comes to accuse Aharon of something, and Aharon says, "You missed the point, right? You you missed something very basic." So what was the basic point that he missed? So one reason is. 
that Aaron says, we were in Onain, right? And Onain is before you buried your dead, right? They were in the middle of this, we're not made in Luim. Apparently they didn't bury Nadav and Abiyu yet. And when you're in Onain, you're not allowed to be eating the, the Mikdash meat. So in other words, the sacrifice was good, but we were in Onain, we didn't eat the meat. Another reason was to say that maybe the meat became impure. And because of that, they didn't eat it. And that's why they burnt it, okay? So now let's get back to our topic. So we're trying to find out, which is not what happened here, how we know that if Yotze, if you take it out, you're supposed to burn it. So they try to learn it from these pesukim. Dichtiv. Hein lo kodesh pnima. Okay, remember, Moshe says to him, did you, and we said, right, the, the Gemara is going to explain it. We'll see in a minute that Moshe was kind of asking him, did you bring the blood inside? And is that why you burnt it? Amar lo Moshe la'arom. Madua, here it goes. Madua lo achalti matachatat. Why didn't you eat the chatat? Shema, maybe. And here, instead of accusing, you didn't, it's worded more as a question. I think they want to soften the, the interaction here and say, Moshe is suggesting all types of things. Maybe you did this. Shema nichnas dama lafanai v'lifni. Maybe you brought the blood inside. And then, right, in classic Midrash land, we're going to have a conversation here, even though it didn't appear in the Psukim. And Aaron says, Amarlo, love. No, that's not what happened. Amarlo. So Moshe suggests something else. And this is where we're going to learn our halacha from. Again, this is not what appears in the Psukim, but this is the drasha on the Psukim. Then Moshe suggested some other reason, maybe, why you burnt it. Amarlo. Shema chutzlam chitzata He suggests, and here we're going to learn from this drasha, that so maybe you brought it outside, the Azara, which would teach you what? That's why you burnt it, which means that if you take it outside, this was exactly our proof, then you have to burn it. And we get it from this interaction, even though it doesn't exactly say it in the first, but it's a drashah. So Amar lo lav, and Aaron says, no, that's not the reason. Bakoda shaita, all the time, it was in the sanctuary, in, in the Azara. I didn't bring it inside, I didn't bring it outside, right? It was in exactly the right place. Amar lo. This is just now a continuation of the conversation. We already used this for our point, which was if Yotze, then you have to burn it. So if it wasn't that and it wasn't that, now Moshe is back to his question. So then why didn't you eat it? What can you infer from here now? Now they stop the conversation and the, the explanation. They say, from here you can see that if you were to take it out, Inami ayel damalifnim, or you brought the blood inside where you weren't allowed to, which again doesn't, it's not important to us for our sugya, but strafahi, you'd have to burn it. So here's your proof. But the Gemara has a little bit of an issue with this proof. Bishlama nitma, I understand, with the nitma pasuk. Now we're going back. We had two pasukim now. One was about if the basar becomes tame, and that says it explicitly in the verse. And the context there, by the way, is important to know this for the next line, was the korban shlamim, which is kochim kalim. And now we have this verse to teach you Yotze, but it's by Kodshe Kodshim, only by a Chatat, which is a higher level of sanctity, to which the Gemara is going to ask. So the Nitma Pasuk is perfect because Gali Rachmana Bekodshim Kalim, Koshkim Bekodshe Kodshim. If it's in the lower level sanctity sacrifices, you have to burn it, or obviously the higher level sanctity ones will have to be burnt. But Yotze, the Pasuk was all about Kodshe Kodshim. So Eshkachan Kodshe Kodshim. But where am I going to learn for the lower sanctity korbanot? Just because a chatat that goes out has to be burned doesn't necessarily prove anything about, let's say, a shlamim or a korban pesach. So vitu, and additionally, ha ditanya, it says in a brayta, lan dama, nishpach dama, yatsa dama chutz leklaim, dekaim alam b'srefa minalim. There's a brayta where they ask the following question. If the blood was left overnight, or the blood was spilled, or the blood went outside the klaim of a kotshub kalim, how do we know that you're supposed to burn it? And there's no answer given. So there is no clear proof. If there was a clear proof, they would have used it. We don't have a proof, really. So so we're back to square one, because this is a nice proof, but it only helps us with Kachim Kachim. It doesn't help us with Kachim Kalim. And that's what we need, because we're talking about the Pesach. So they say, we're going to learn it from what Rabbi Shimon says. Rabbi Shimon Amal, Omer. Now, next Pasuk. Okay, we're now moving to Pasuk in Bayikra, Perak. Vav pasuk kaf gimel. It says, "This is a pasuk that teaches us this halacha that was referenced in the section we just read." If you take the blood into the ol moed, the ol moed was parallel to the sanctuary, the hechal in the temple. If you take the blood from a chatat that's supposed to be outside and you bring it inside ol moed, bakodesh, right? Lechaper bakodesh, lo teachel baesh shisaref. You have to burn it. So, what does he come and say? And learn from here. What do we learn from here? We learn from here that the chatat has to be burned in the sanctuary if it gets disqualified. 
So now they say, wait, only Ella Zobilvat. It sounds like we only have about a chatat, which is kochim kochim. Sharp sule kochim kochim, the imule kochim kalaminalan. So, first of all, maybe it's just a chatat. How do we know about all sanctified items on the same level, which would include all other kochim kochim and kochim kalim that get burnt on the altar? How do we know about those? Those are more sanctified because they're the parts that get burnt on the altar, like the oterit akaved and the klayot and the parts that we saw in the chelev. Tamud lomar vichol. The beginning of that pasuk says v'chol. That comes to include all kochi kochi. But now they say, that doesn't help us at all. That wasn't a good proof because we're still stuck at square one. Eshkechan kochi kochim, kochim kalim minalan. It still doesn't teach you about kochim kalim. Ela, they say, kol psulo bakodesh b'schrefa. They're now going to learn differently. They're going to say the same halacha, but they're going to learn it in a different way. Any psul bakodesh b'schrefa, Anything that gets disqualified in the sanctuary, right, or not in the sanctuary, with kodshim, okay, gets burnt. Loshna kodshim, kodshim, kodshim kalim, loshna kodshim, kodshim. It doesn't matter whether it's high level, low level. Gemara gemirale. It's all learned from halacha lamosh misinai. This basically means, oh, you don't have to worry if there's a verse or not. It's all derived from halacha lamosh misinai. To which they say, wait, so what do we do with this whole pasuk of the chatat of Aaron that we tried to learn, kodshim, kodshim, get burnt? Says, they were just telling you the story. This is a fascinating line that the Torah is telling you stories. They wanted you to know what happened. It wasn't to teach you halacha. Okay, first of all, you could say it was teaching you about human behavior. And, you know, Moshe shouldn't have suspected him and, you know, teach you all these things that we were discussing today. But it's not to teach you halacha. So basically, we're going to say you don't need any verses to prove any of these laws because they're all derived from halacha and Moshe Sinai. It's an ancient tradition passed down. And you don't need a verse to prove it then. Okay, so all we did so far from this Mishnah was try to say, Nitma, we have a verse. If the the um, if it gets taken out from where it was supposed to be, it gets burnt. And we learned that halacha l'mosh misina. That's basically what we said. So now they have a few more questions. Litana de Rabba Baravua. Okay, in the, the Tana who was in the house of Rabba Baravua who brought this Brita that we learned already a few days ago. Da'amal, if you remember, until now, we're saying any disqualification has to be burnt immediately. But there was another opinion about it who said, a filu pigul, which is the highest level because that disqualification gets you curry if you eat it. Ta'un ibor tsura needs to be left overnight and even that doesn't get burnt immediately. Minalan, where does he get it from? We know this, yalif avon avon minyota. If you remember, avon was, there was a, the word avon, I brought this all on the sheet, I'm not gonna go through the psukim, but you can see them in Vayikra Zayin Yuchet, is pigul, vayikra yutet, chet is about notal. Both sukim have the word avon in them. So we make exera shava to notal. Notar by its nature is to ubar tsurato because it's meat that was left overnight. And, or maybe you left it two days, depending on how many days you have to eat it. And that automatically only gets burnt once you have ibar tsura. So they say pigul is derived from notar. And this is a unique position that even pigul needs ibar tsura. So now they question this and they say, if you're going to learn it from Xerah Shava, Avon Avon from Nota, why don't you learn it from Xerah Shava, Nelaf Avon Avon Michatata Aaron? In the section of Aaron, it also said Avon. So why don't you say, learn Xerah Shava from there and learn that you have to burn it immediately? So why did they say, why did the Tana and Rabbi Bravua say to Bartzorato because of the Xerah Shava? Could have made Xerah Shava to there. So Marlacha, he would answer, chatat, and that's, he's not here to answer, but he would answer if you asked him, right? If he could, he could answer. Chatat Aaron ki agav nanami ibor tzura lidorot baya. Okay, it's a little bit backwards. This it should say, baya ibor tzura lidorot. It needs ibor tzura going forward. The hatam horaat sha'ayta. Also good answer. What does it say? When it happened with Aaron, he had to burn it immediately because that, was a horaat sha'a. This means it was a unique event, right? Again, this was the Imam Miluim. Everybody was watching. You know, sometimes things at big events like that have to happen a little differently than they would in the regular daily life. So because it happened then, and this, they had to make a point about it. So they did it immediately. But normally, this was what the Tana of Rabbi Baravua would claim, normally it needs Ibor Tzura. Again, this is a unique opinion that we don't generally hold by, but it's this one unique opinion. We have to explain it. Why did we learn it from our own? Because our own was a horaat sha'a. Okay, just like we said before, it's almost like saying that. This is the way it went, right? But it's not that you can learn from here for future generations. Now back to where we were just before we started with Rabbi Baravua, where we in the end said, 
Hashda Damrin, and they'll repeat it right now. Now that we said, all of it is just Allah Lamosh Misinai. So now we darshan some Sakim before. How are we going to darshan them? So what do we do with these words? We tried to say before that means all Kodshe Kodshim, right? Bachol, Chatat, right? And then it said, Bakodesh, Ba'esh Sarev was coming to teach you that they have to be burnt immediately. But we already learned that now from Allah Lamosh Messina. We don't need that first. So what's that first proving? It's to teach you the location, not when you have to burn it, but where you have to burn it. You have to burn it Bakodesh by Eshisarev has to be burned in the Azara. You don't burn it outside, you burn it inside. Well, now what about this meat? The meat that becomes impure, of course, you have to burn. If Halachlamosh Misinai, right? It says any kind of Psul Bakodesh. So what do we do with that verse that so simply says you have to burn meat that becomes Tame? You obviously don't need that verse if you have the Halachlamosh Misinai. So what do they say? We need it for itself, meaning, right? This means we need it simply. We don't need to draw shot from it. We just need it for its simple meaning. You might have thought, any psul bakodesh, you would have thought, you might have thought that what gets burnt, anything like the blood being left overnight, because you have to sprinkle the blood that day, the blood spilling, the blood being leaving its space or slaughtering at nighttime. What's unique about those that's different from the meat becoming Tameh? There's no such comparable example in the world outside the temple. So these are unique just to the temple. So of course you have to burn them. But but if meat becomes Tameh, this could be something that's relevant also outside the temple. It also, right, we, we keep laws of Tum and Tara outside the temple also. So maybe since this is something that's not unique to the temple, but could also happen outside the temple. Maybe when it happens in the temple, maybe it doesn't need to be burned. Now, this is another thing we're not going to get into now, but we'll see all over, especially in Tzvachim, there's different things that can become disqualified. Some get burnt and some get buried. Okay, and there's chumras about each one, but really generally Sreifa seems more stringent. So you might have thought maybe it's enough to just bury it. That's why the verse needs to tell you no not buried, needs to be burned. But the fact that it happens immediately and you don't do two bar tzura, that we learn from Halakha Lamosh Messina. Next part of the Mishnah. So the last part of the Mishnah, we saw there was a machlok. Remember the first part was, the meat becomes tame. That's a psul bigufa korban, in the body of the korban. That we're gonna say has to be burned. But if something happened to the owners, right? Or to the, um, or they died, Right, they died, it became impure. Then we have a machloket, chubar tsurato, or nisraf. Or Yochanan ben Broca said nisraf, but the Tanakhama said it gets you wait. So Amar of Yosef, the question is, what's the situation that they have an argument about? We're going to see. There's two stages. What the owners could have died or became impure after we finish the sacrificing, because remember, we wait till nighttime to eat it. So in between the time after we sprinkle the blood until we eat it, or Maybe after it was slaughtered, but before the blood was sprinkled. So Amar of Yosef, it must be where they became impure after the zrika. Because the basar was already re'oi And that's why they have a machloket about it. Because one opinion says, at this point, it's not majorly disqualified because at some point you could have eaten it. So we have to wait to two bar uh, And the other opinion says, no, we don't. But if they became impure before we even sprinkled the blood, was never, then then everyone will agree you burn it immediately. However, this opinion of Rav Yosef is going to be rejected. They bring a bright to contradict. It's actually a tosefta to contradict. This is the rule. If it's in the goof of the, of the korban, you burn it immediately. But if it's the blood or the owners, then you have to leave it. If the meat itself is in mitma, then you leave it. Now, notice the comparison here. They put Baalim next to Dam. 
Katane balim dumia de dam. Now, when would the dam be relevant if something happened to it? Obviously, before we sprinkle the blood. Once we sprinkle the blood, if something happens to the leftover blood, usually you pour it into the base of the altar. But nothing happens. Like, you don't ruin the carbon if something happened to the blood later. You've already done your carbon. So, therefore, they say, balim dumia de dam, ma dam lifnezrika, af balim lifnezrika, since balim is put right next to the dam in this bright, in this tosefta, we assume it's whatever's true for one is true for the other. The dam is obviously before you sprinkle the blood. Therefore, the owners are also before you sprinkle the blood. And here it says, to ubar tzurato. So this shows they must have a machloket before. And therefore, Eli'it mar hachit mar, for Yosef really said something. This is what he said. Machloket shenitmu balim lifnezlika. Dilo itchazi basar lachila. Because the meat was never ra'oi. And that's why they have a machloket. Dahave leke psulo begufo. Because they say, maybe that's like a psula guf. But if it happens after the sacrifice was done, great. And then something happened to the owners, then everyone's going to agree that you can't burn it immediately. You wait till two bar surah and the machloket is really before. So Rabbi Yosef thinks the machloket is before the blood is sprinkled and not after. There, everyone would agree to bar surah too. But Rabbi Yochanan disagrees and says, According to Rabbi Yochanan, they disagree in both cases. Both cases is a machloket. And we're going to say that as Rabbi Yochanan the time, may he follows his own, what he says elsewhere, he's consistent. To Amar Rabbi Yochanan, Rabbi Yochanan beborka Rabbi Nechemi amru davar achad. He and Rabbi Nechemi said the same thing. And we're going to come full circle and go back to the story of Aaron. So if he says he and Rabbi Yochanan ben Bruka and Rabbi Nechemia say the same thing, and what's going to be clear here is that he thinks they also argue after Zrika. So Ditani, Rabbi Nechem, okay, so Rabbi Yochanan ben Bruka, Hadamaram, where do they say the same thing? Rabbi Yochanan ben Bruka in our Mishnah says the same thing as Rabbi Nechemia. What's Rabbi Nechemia Maihi? Where? Ditani, Rabbi Nechemia Omer, and I told you there was a machloket about this. What was the problem with Aaron and his sons? Mipnei ani nut nisrafazo. They burnt it because they were onanim. Now, when does Onin kick in? In other words, what's the problem? They sacrifice the sacrifice. Everything was done perfectly fine. It's just that they can't eat it. So that's clearly a psul of after the blood was sprinkled. This is why Aaron said, you're calling me Ka'ele? You're accusing me? And what's, right? Aninut is clearly like after Zrika. And what do you see here? They burnt it immediately. So this, con- this goes against what Rabbi Yosef said, that if it happens after and the basar was already, could have been eaten potentially, then you have to wait to Ubar Tzorato, you don't burn it immediately. Rabbi Nechemia clearly thinks otherwise. He thinks that one opinion at least would say, Yisaref Miyad, and that would go like Aharon. And therefore, we say that, now you would have to say that we learn from Aharon, even though the Gemara before said we don't really learn from Aharon, but you'd have to say we do. And therefore, we see that they both said the same thing. And that was just brought to prove that Rabbi Yochanan is consistent within his approach. Okay, a lot for today, but I hope you found it interesting and we'll pick up from tomorrow.